City of Sunnyvale's first Sustainable Speaker Series event of the year. Thank you for joining us for tonight's event. This old zero emission house climate retrofits on a limited budget with Sean Armstrong. As attendees begin to join the Zoom, I'll take a moment for a quick introduction. My name is Shannon Keener, and I'm an environmental program specialist with the City of Sunnyvale's Environmental Services Department. I will now pass it over to my colleague who is joining us. Hi, yes. My name is Allison Solis, the Sustainability Community Engagement Fellow for the City of Sunnyvale's Environmental Services Department. Thank you for being here today, and I'll pass it back to Shannon for our Zoom poll. Excellent. Thank you, Allison. As we wait for people to continue logging in, we have a few Zoom polls to run through. We'll start those here in just a moment. Excellent. So our first question for those on the call is what percentage of Sunnyvale's greenhouse gas emissions do you think homes contribute to? Okay, if you can see the multiple choice answers on the poll, please choose the option that you think homes contribute to our greenhouse gas emissions. Excellent, we have some answers currently coming in right now. Wonderful, all right, thank you all for submitting those answers. Oh, let's see. Sorry, thank you everyone. Excellent, okay. Excellent, thank you everyone for submitting those answers. And we will now, oops, uh, yes. So here we have the breakdown of Sunnyvale's greenhouse gas emissions um, for community wide. Residential and gas, residential gas and residential, residential electricity combined is about 18% of emissions, which is almost a quarter of the pie graph. So option B would be our answer of 18%. The light blue slice of the pie chart shows the emissions from natural gas in homes, and thanks to clean electricity provided by Silicon Valley Clean Energy, residential electricity creates 0% of our emissions. We'll move on to our next question, which is, what is Sunnyvale's greenhouse gas reduction target for 2030? We'll wait for some of those answers to come in here. Excellent. Just another moment as we get some answers rolling in. All right. Excellent. So we'll move on to our result here, which is um, the answer here would be B, which is 56% below the 1990 levels. And this here is our Climate Action Playbook scorecard, which you can find on our webpage. It shows our two targets, one of reaching 56% below the 1990 levels by 2030, and the second goal of reaching 80% below the 2050 levels, or below the 1990 levels by 2050. Our current levels from 2020 show that we are 44% below 1990 levels. So we are on our way to reaching the 2030 goal, but we still have many hurdles to cross over in order to get there. And as more people begin to join the call here, we'll move on to our next question. Excellent, so we should see question number three, which is what are the benefits of building decarbonization? Choices here could include having a healthier and safer home, saving money and energy, having cleaner air, creating a sustainable environment, or all of the above. Great. 
Great. We'll give just another moment for this one. And yes, you can see that um, the answer here would then be D, all of the above. Electrifying or decarbonizing your home can lead to all of these um, benefits listed above. Great, so I will pass it on now to Allison for our next poll question. Great, thank you. So now I will be going over the last two polling questions. So for the question, what do you think is the most difficult appliance to retrofit in your home? Um, for the first option, it is water heater. Second option, stove. Third option, washer slash dryer. Or the last option, heating slash AC. So which answer is it going to be? So it looks like most people chose heating slash AC. So thank you everybody for your answers. And I know everybody wants to know the answer and you will get to learn which one is the correct answer by listening to Sean's presentation. You will learn more about how difficult or easy these appliances are to electrify. So stay tuned and pay close attention throughout the presentation. And then for the next and last polling question, have you heard of Bayrun? They help you connect with rebates. So the answer options are, yes, you have heard of Bayrun or no, you have not heard of Bayrun. So please let us know if you have heard of them. Hopefully you have, if not, no worries. We will soon have a short presentation from a Bayrun representative. So it looks like most people put no, that they have not heard of Bayron, which is okay. Um, yes, next slide, please. Okay, so to further go into the previous questions, what is building decarbonization? and explaining what Bayron is. So first, building decarbonization is the process of removing fossil fuels from a building's energy use and using appliances that only use clean electricity. So for example, one way of decarbonizing buildings is replacing gas appliances with electric appliances, and Sean will go further into this in his presentation. And then Bayron is the coalition of the Bay Area's nine counties a network of local governments partnering to promote resource efficiency at the regional level, focusing on energy, water, and greenhouse gas reduction. Bayron representative Jeffrey Ling will be speaking more about their rebates. So thank you for listening. I'll pass it back to Shannon. Great, thank you, Allison. Next, I would like to introduce our Sustainability Commission speaker, who's going to be Justin Wang. He will provide you with more information on tonight's event. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this year's first sustainability sustainability speaker series event. Uh, a little bit of alliteration there. This <laughs> the event is titled "This Old Zero Emission House Climate Retrofits on a Limited Budget." So, just to provide some quick background on the sustainability speaker series, the series brings renowned experts in sustainability research and policy development to share their ideas and innovations with our community. The 2021 to 2022 theme is equity and resilience. Recent events have made it clear that our actions to address climate change need to be equitable and build resilience. Sean and Jeffrey will share resources with the community that will help create efficient and healthy homes. So some logistical information for the webinar, just so everyone knows, uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the city's website in the following weeks. We will also be sending everyone the links following the webinar. Attendees can type questions into the chat at any point during the event and will be answered during the Q&A session, which we are having as the last 30 minutes of the event. Questions, your questions will not be visible to the audience until they are answered, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. And finally, we very much value your feedback. Please fill out the evaluation form on Google Forms after the event. The link will be posted in the chat, and it will also be emailed to those who registered on Eventbrite after the event. Some technical information for Zoom. Uh, in, in, if you're interested in hiding the subtitles across your screen, 
select the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and select hide subtitle. And to see the full transcription of the event, select live transcript and select view full transcripts. And finally, before we get started, I would like to introduce our Bayren representative, Jeffrey Liang. Wonderful, thank you, Justin. Uh, as just to say, I'm Jeffrey Liang with the Bay Area Regional Energy Network. And to be honest, I was surprised that 40% uh, of people have actually heard of us. Uh, most people have, you know, most people I speak to don't know who Bay Ren is. Um, but as I, I think it was uh, said earlier, we are a collaboration of the nine Bay Area counties. You can see that here on the screen. And we formed a collaboration to be able to receive funds from the California Public Utilities Commission to run different energy efficiency and electrification programs. And so when you, um, when you pay your PG&E bill or your energy bill, there's a little public goods charge. That's funds that goes to the state to fund these programs. And so there are all, you know, we have a several programs. Um, we have ones to help multifamily save um, energy, to kind of help label buildings on how they perform energy wise. And the program that I represent is called the single family program, although it's two to four units. And we essentially um, administer the rebate program, which um, we've done since 2013. And we've helped over 10,000 homes um, make these upgrades and we've uh, dispersed over $24 million in rebates. So you may not have heard of us, but we have been kind of behind the scenes helping upgrade homes throughout the Bay Area. Um, next, please. So as I, the rebate program that I'm talking about is called Home Plus, and you can find our website there at the bottom, bayren.org backslash homeowners. And so essentially we give up to $5,000 in rebates for it says energy efficiency. I should update that to energy efficiency and electrification. Um, as of March 2020, we were allowed to offer um, rebates for switching from gas to electric. So we've done that. And so how this program works is we have trained embedded participating contractors who go out and do the work and more, more importantly for you, do all the paperwork for you. Uh, except there are two measures that you apply for on your own, which are... Um, induction stoves and heat pump clothes dryers since you know, there's not as much requirements around installing those. But otherwise our participating contractors do the work. And the important part is, you know, we have oversight over them so we can do the QA and QC, make sure that there's no, any, no health and safety issues after they leave. So that's why a lot of times we get that question, why do you have to go through a participating contractor? We know that it can be a little bit difficult. You know, you may go to our contracted database and you know not recognize any names. So we have uh, home energy advisors who are you know they're no cost to you, and their job is just to walk you through this whole process from finding a contractor to looking at bids to you know checking up on your rebate status. So that 866-878-6008 number is that um, is how to reach that. And I, you know, um, I'll try to send the email and also you can schedule your own uh, appointment with them. So uh, I'll try to pass that information on to Sunnyvale in, in the follow-up email. Um, one last thing I also wanna mention is they also do referrals to complementary programs. So we know that it can be really confusing out there because there's programs from us, there's programs from the CCA, there's even programs from the state, which I imagine Sean will cover a little bit. And so not only can you take advantage of our uh, rebates, but there's also you know, other financing or like resources that you can take advantage of. And so our home energy advisors are meant to be a one-stop shop where you can come to them and they can direct you to all those other um, programs out there. So um, if nothing else, if you don't remember anything else from what I'm saying, you remember that you can contact us to get that guidance throughout the process. Next, please. There we go. So I'm not going to go uh, item by item here. These are just a list of the rebates that we have. Um, I, I did want to just quickly mention that you know, we're, we're talking a lot about electrification, which is 
you know, absolutely where we want to go. But I do also want to briefly encourage people to look at the, you know, the kind of the unsexy measures of weatherization, things like duct sealing and attic insulation, wall insulation. Um, we don't typically, those don't get a lot of publicity, but um, the idea really uh, what you want to do is to try to reduce the weight you know, the, the amount of draftiness, um, you know, our, our duct systems leak on average 30%. So, you know, a lot of the energy we're generating goes out to our attics and our crawl spaces and make the mice and spiders really happy. Um, you want to get that into your house rather than into those spaces. And I think the best analogy I heard is you don't buy a new car and then run it on, uh, leak on flat tires. So that's kind of the concept that we want to get across. And then definitely once you've done that, then you know how much to size solar and how much all these uh, other things will need. And then you can better size all your systems so that it's not producing too much. And you'll even see in our bonus rebates there, um, we have a, a rebate for downsizing your heating and cooling system. And I think Sean will talk a little bit about this, but the reason we have that is if you do all these efficiency things correctly, and you actually ask the you know, contractor to do what's called load calculations, which determine how much heating and cooling need to go into each room, then you, would, you might actually find you need a, a lot smaller system and that would save you money as well as getting you this rebate. So um, I know Sean will talk about the rebates. Um, I'll also say there, you know, this, especially for heat pump water heaters and heat pumps, uh, it only says a thousand here, but the state will give you up to 6,600 combined, um, you know, total uh, ours and, you know, they'll top off to 60, potentially 6,600. So, um, you know, be, uh, just know that you can get more than this beyond our program. One last thing I wanna say is I'm gonna drop our um, YouTube channel link into the chat. Uh, we also have videos on um, someone who's, uh, we have several videos, you know, some on like electric cooking and um, how, why induction is good for you. Or we have um, uh, collaborations with Lawrence Berkeley National Labs Indoor Air Quality Division talking about why um, electrification is good for indoor air quality. So I encourage you to go look at that video, uh, go to that, um, our page. There's even a little um, short video uh, with Goldilocks going to three homes and figuring out why, um, how to get the just right home. So thank you all very much. Um, please, uh, I hope you utilize our home energy advisors and get those rebates for yourself. Thank you. And I'll pass it on to, uh, I guess, back to Shannon or <laughs> straight to Sean. <laughs> I think it's back to me. I'll, oh, I'll without you. further ado, I it, well then I'll soon be passing the mic to the star of the show, uh, another one of our stars, Sean Armstrong. Uh, but thank you, Jeffrey. So just a quick by, uh, introduction for Sean. Sean Armstrong is, of course, the managing principal of Redwood Energy. He has worked for over twenty-five years in building electrification, and he has designed over ten thousand all-electric residences for disadvantaged communities. Sean has co-authored five practical guides to building electrification, and he has also worked on the development of gas bands and the California Energy Code. Sean has received sustainable design awards from the United Nations, the United States Department of Energy, and the SoCal Building Industry Association. So now, truly, without any further ado, uh, Sean, please take it away. Hey, thank you, Justin. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you all. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Allison. Okay, so... I am going to show you how you could transform your lovely house to look like one of these lovely houses. It's been done all over the country. California is honestly kind of late to the game because we had such a gas friendly code up until about 2019. Our code was hardcore pushing it. And the code we have now, that our energy code, and really all of the rebates, all of the intellectual mechanisms behind a code, all of that up until the code that just got adopted this last year. All of it's been gas friendly. So in new construction, you could see it most where between 2010 and 2017, 1% of construction was all electric in California. Most of that was stuff that we were doing as affordable housing. 99%, <laughs> whereas in the rest of the country in that period of time, it was one in four homes, not one in a hundred. So anyway, let's, let's walk through what's been going on. Next slide. I'm gonna give my quick intro, hi. 
Um, the, the story I'd tell you is that I started, I started studying all electric housing back in 1995 in college. This demonstration house is why I came across the country from Ohio. I'd seen it in the, the university catalog. So it was um, solar powered, had a wind turbine, we're doing biodiesel, it was off grid on batteries, it had lots of different pedal powered devices. The house is still there, it's the oldest demonstration house in the country. Then I was a science teacher briefly, but I was really enjoying putting the solar panels up on the high school more than the teaching part. <laughs> and I love the teaching, but um, I realized that maybe development was my true calling. And I went into that. I did for six years, created an affordable housing company that with a division within a larger development company. And now it only does this because we figured out that zero net energy was so profitable. It's for profit business, really clear, all electric, 100% solar powered, made more money. So I've been consulting on that ever since. And my coolest, biggest project right now is this 500 unit development um, on the Washington DC Beltway that is uh, low income senior housing, market rate housing, but it's got a nine story tall PV wall on the north side and the south side and canopies all over the roof. And it's just because it's cost effective, it's crazy. So um, next slide. I wanted to do a history, like a little story time together um, check this graph out. This is showing how quickly um, various technologies have been adopted. And most of these are all like electric technologies, really. Like, you know, you're looking at the color TV, for instance, or the microwave or the internet, you know, for that matter. Um, but what you see over and over is it takes about 15 years to go from zero to hero, you know, from like the very early, earliest adopters. And so I think we can get to 2035 zero carbon economy uh, from where we are right now. Next slide. I want to like story time. Um, I'm from rural Wisconsin, which was electrified under the Rural Electrification Administration. I grew up in electric co-ops that were created by neighbors coming together like yourselves and deciding that they were going to like literally band together and get electrical lines delivered to their homes because only 10% of rural households had electricity in 1935, 10%, 90% in the cities. <laughs> so um, next slide. In the 40s, we got air conditioning, truly one of the great luxuries of life, cooling off in the summer. Next slide. In the 50s, it got real. Electrification took off. And it was Ronald Reagan. <clears throat> he was uh, like his last movie, he was, he was co-starring literally with a chimpanzee. So his career kind of fizzled out. And he got picked up by a bunch of utilities to go shill for them. And he rocked it. He went all over the country starting in 1953, opening up all the nuclear power plants including like we have like the second one in the country here in California. And the utilities hooked them up with this all electric mansion. So the swimming pool, the electric outside lighting, everything in there is all tricked out with Westinghouse and Whirlpool's newest appliances. And you take people on tours and you can go see them. And he had the number one television show. He used all his contacts from Hollywood. And on Sunday nights, you'd um, be able to see Judy Garland or James Dean. <laughs> um, playing their favorite piece of theater with little jingle advertisements, live better electrically in the in between. Next slide. So the seventies is the era of um, demonstration homes. I think that started to go um, bigger. So the one on the left, that's the one in Berkeley, the integral urban house. They wrote a book, which then was used as the Bible, like the guide for making demonstration houses in the Carter era, a few years later after they published. Carter came in, we had thousands of demonstration homes around the country showing every little community how they could put insulative curtains or how they could have a greenhouse on the side of the house to help warm the house or how to insulate and weatherize and air tighten, all of it. And all of them disappeared when Reagan came into office as president, <laughs> um, except for this one, because it's student funded. Next slide. So uh, Carter, you know, famously, conservation is the only way we can buy a barrel of oil for a few dollars. California in 1974 passed its Warren Alquist Act, which is the foundation of our energy code. So this is 70s is like when energy conservation became hip. Before that, it was load increase, just more electricity, more is better. We can always make more nuclear power plants. Um, and finally, we sort of came to see limitations and the cost effectiveness of, of acknowledging them. Next. This is the end of the era of nuclear power. <laughs> Three mile island accident. Um, very few nuclear power plants have been brought online since then. And um, you know, Germany has been aggressively shutting down there, which is part of the whole geopolitical situation with Russia because Germany wants Russia's natural gas. Um, 
but there's a big deal. Middletown, Pennsylvania got irradiated with a, a big cloud. Um, next slide. So Reagan came into his presidency and he'd always been an advocate for nuclear power, but in 1980 and in 81, when he walks in the door, um, nuclear power is in a true crisis. And so he picks a vice president who's an oil baron and also a CIA spook. <laughs> and, and together they, um, they did do the job of, of creating a gigantic domestic drilling uh, program where America became oil independent. We are today, we're a net exporter actually of fossil fuels. Um, but they also turned their back on conservation and solar power and wind power. And they, they continue to try to push nuclear power, not very successfully. Next slide. So I think the next good part of the story um, is when we passed the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, you can see our current governor in the background of that photo. You can see our former governor, governor. And uh, then over on the right-hand side, you can see that Greta Thunberg, who doesn't really let people touch her, um, is genuinely like their buddies, Arnold and Greta. They go to conferences and they speak sitting next to each other, just the two of them, you know, fighting the good fight. And what we've seen in California since 2006 is having to really intellectually engage of what does it look like on technical, personal, et cetera, level to decarbonize rapidly. So we passed the first and kind of only law in our country that that's a law law for like a whole state that says we're going to decarbonize and we're going to do it in this schedule. Next slide. So uh, the rebates and the programs that came out of the late 2000s, because um, we did also get uh, tax credits of Bush the second. Um, he signed into law the Energy Independence Act, which included renewable energy tax credits as well as oil development. And all these folks have solar on the roof. I love that a whole bunch of the Avengers, you know, as well as world saving heroes have solar on the roof. Um, I, by the way, have a, a habit of going into YouTube and doing house tours of stars. It's one of my like little dirty secrets. <laughs> I genuinely enjoy seeing how they live. <laughs> Next slide. So, um, and then this was sort of this quiet revolution that I discovered in the Propane Education Research Council 2016 report. They're like, what is going on? They hired ICF to try to figure out why across the entire nation propane was learning, losing market share, rural and urban. In yellow is what you see where electric energy uses of domestic hot water and space heating are gaining market share. Those are 90% of what is using gas in a house. Cooking and drying is like laundry drying is the other 10%-ish. So they study those two gigantic loads. And what they're seeing is that developers who produce 95% of new construction in the country had uniformly decided that this was the most cost-effective way to build in every part of the country with only a few exceptions. You know, and in the areas that are like red with wood, I mean, you know these are fairly low population areas that are using wood almost everywhere where people live, we've been moving towards electrification, including in California, even in opposition to our code, it was still gaining market share. Next slide. So um, now I'm going, and we're done a story hour, we're here. And I want to show you these resources. Um, the one on the left is our newest guide and that's the guide to retrofits. And we're gonna go into that tonight together. And the one on the right is for new construction. It's like a, about a year older of a book but it still has lots of fun case studies, lots of discussion. But I think what we're all talking about here tonight is this booklet on the left. You can see the link, you can go there. It's a free download, et cetera. Next slide. All right, I'm gonna start with home where I am. Um, so on the left-hand side, this is my family's house. On the right-hand side, this is my mom's house. Uh, we lost the farm in Wisconsin in the, the Great Recession, literally like the balloon loan was called and such and we had to sort, sell the 150 acre farm lost it. <laughs> so on the right hand side is what we were able to build with the money left over. We restored an old woodshed, added a little addition. And on the left hand side, this is a hundred year old farmhouse. Next slide. This is what we did. On the left hand side, you see what's called a ductless mini split. Ductless means it's not blowing air through duct work. These are um, the fan coil is on the wall. This little capsule looking thing sits on the wall, blows air into one room, you know, wherever it is. And uh, that replaced the gas wall heater that we moved into, which was from the 40s. And it replaced the wood stove, which was the original wood stove from the late 19, 19 teens when the house was built. 
So we still have just one place where the heat is delivered in the house, but now it's a heat pump and the house is way warmer than it was under, we lived with both of those systems and neither of them could heat the house. Then um, we have a heat pump water heater. Uh, that one has a cute little coil draped over it. You never see that because that's a 120 volt retrofit ready heat pump water heater. Something that I and others have been pushing the manufacturers to develop um, for almost a decade now. And the products are finally being field tested and finally coming out where you can just plug the water heater into any outlet. Don't, no fancy plumbing, just stick it into you know, whatever outlet's close by. Um, then similarly, that dryer washing and drying machine I'm pointing at so excitedly my um, brother fled COVID in New York City with his family, moved to Arcata also, and this was, he got the washer dryer. So I got to be, like bring my laundry over. <laughs> like, oh, tell me how it works. So this is um, an all-in-one machine. And what's important in bioelectrification is that this can plug into any outlet in your house. Unlike most washers, most, most washers of course can't. Most drying machines can't plug into any outlet. They need a specialized outlet. This is a drying machine the first is using a super efficient washer to get all the water out, really fast spin cycle. And then it's essentially um, a ventless electric resistance dryer. But so it's not as like efficient at drying, but you don't have to vent it. So you don't have to put a hole in the wall and you can just plug it in anywhere. That's the best thing, plug in anywhere. And this, this $20,000 we spent, this is for both houses for electrifying them. Okay, so then on here, this drink pod, this is a two burner induction range. You can buy them for like 130 bucks from Home Depot. And I honestly like it the most. And I've tried them all. It's quiet. It's my favorite, favorite one for just being really quiet. And it does all the other jobs of like low temperature, high temperature, boiling water, things like that. It's 130 bucks. Um, but th this is the one I got for my mom though. It's a bit of a gift. It was a two oven induction range made by KitchenAid. It was like, $2,400, $2,800 something. I stopped looking after a while. I didn't realize how expensive a gift it was gonna be. <laughs> um, but it's this gorgeous KitchenAid double oven with a four, five burner induction range on top. So that's the thing we splurged on. All in 20 grand. Next slide. And I wanna show you a bunch of houses, what it costs so you can get a budget in mind. I'm very budget oriented because I, I mostly consult on affordable housing. So this is in Ohio. But as I have a nice data sample here, I paid the contractor to give me all these numbers and sort them out for me so I could get, this is like a little study. So um, what you're seeing in blue is the heating and ventilation and air conditioning, the HVAC, quote unquote. Um, so that's in the range of 10 grand, up or down a, a little bit. Then the water heater, or oh, duct work is orange, meaning having to like reseal the ducts or actually put new duct work in because the old stuff is crapped out. That's an orange. Yellow is the water heater. Gray is the comfort. So total building shell cost in gray, you can see that is the number one expense on most of the homes. So this is being done for a few reasons. As Jeffrey was referring to, it's like if you have less air moving through your building, you have to heat less. If you have to heat less, you can spend less money on your furnace, in this case, a heat pump furnace. Um, then if you had a leaky house, it is a very cost-effective thing to do, but these people are spending way more money than cost-effective. They're going for comfort. And I wanna make that clear is that they're not just doing some air sealing. Many of these houses are completely re-insulating. And the people on the other side of this got what they really wanted, which was comfort. But yeah, the HVAC system is what delivers heat and cool, but they air tightened and insulated. You may want that, you may not need it, etc. up to you. And then four grand for project management. So you can see the range of costs between 10 grand and 50 grand, which correlates with the size of the house. The 10 grand house is 1,617 square feet. And the 50 grand house is 2,700 square feet and is the largest house. But um, that house is not so much bigger that it should be four times more, five times more expensive. Um, Mark, you were asking about the all-in-one washer dryer how much they cost, about two, well, I'll show you in a little bit, but it's about $1,800 for the, the one that I recommend, 16 to 2,000, depending on who you get it from. You can get them all over the internet. And does it work on a 15 amp outlet? Yes, it does. It does not need a 20 amp outlet. A 15 amp outlet is just fine. Next slide. Okay, there's another little cute case study. This was a house, I think in Menlo Park or Palo Alto. 
It's um, our friend, Tom Cabot, who's an expert in home electrification. And I work with him every week. We, we write these books together. Um, he's a, like on a supervisory level advised and we actually write the book, but he's real smart. <laughs> so this is his house. He put in this heat pump on the left. Mr. Cool is the only heat pump that comes with the refrigerant lines pre-charged. No other brand does this, but it makes it so like a normal human being, you or me can clip it in and not need a refrigerant license. That's unique and awesome. It's really much a do-it-yourself product. And there's lots of them that call themselves do-it-themselves, but you have to have someone come and do the refrigerant charge. Mr. Cool, you don't. So he did it himself. And then he put it in his own four or five burner, whatever induction cooktop there. He has a separate oven. Next slide. And here's what it cost. The total was $6,400, but it includes things like $190 for materials and lunch for my buddy. <laughs> but Josie came over and helped him out. Um, uh, or like the, the head installation, I mean, the thing that's on the wall, free with my buddy after we did hers. So Tom and Josie um, Gaylord, th those two are heroes down in your community. Go to any of their workshops, hang out with them. But what you got to see is uh, the heat pump water heater. They bought it, they installed it themselves. So it cost $1,500 or less. The, the, they put in a window heat pump, so it's 400 bucks. Um, the mini split heat pump, more for the house, was looks like $1,700, $1,800 plus uh, labor. The induction cooktop, I bought it for $900, and the electrical work was $190. Then the combined washer dryer, that's uh, $1,600, just plugs in where the prior washer was, replaces washer and the dryer. So all in, $6,400. That could be your budget if you have some time and you're semi-retired. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, now I want to talk about being comfortable. Um, I like this, like internet searches for the most comfortable looking cat and dog, like your Google search for this. You just get to be exposed to so much adorableness. Next slide. Okay, I want to start off with the least expensive solution solution. This is an inverter controlled heat pump, which means it has a computer in it. The computer is doing a lot of thinking and controlling, which fundamentally makes it half or one fourth as loud. One of the big things is way quieter when you put a computer in it. Then this also still it works when it's like 35 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Most heat pumps stop working at about that temperature. This works. This also uses less, 40% less energy during the summer for air conditioning. So, I have been told that I look like Val Kilmer. That's nice of you to say. I, I appreciate that. I haven't heard that in many years and I've been feeling a little chubby, but you know, Val Kilmer got chubby towards his, you know, I'm 46 now and COVID did add 15 pounds, but that, thank you, anonymous. That, that was really sweet of you to say. So um, 600 bucks, you can heat and cool a whole house with this. This is like enough for a 1500 square foot, reasonably well insulated house and it's $600. And, and you put a little insert in the window, close the window on it or a side window also works. So 600 bucks, it's quiet. It does the job of heating your house. It's just one point source, but can't get less expensive than that. Next slide. So um, these, if we're doing the same amount of heating and cooling, they're about three times as expensive to purchase than what I just showed you. And then they're gonna be another three or four times that to install. <laughs> but here you go, this is what's called a ductless mini split. The, the fan coil is there on the left. And then you see these each of these different boxes. They're going up in like how much heating and cooling they can do. And you can see they double up when they get kind of bigger on the right-hand side. And at the bottom, I'm trying to show you in blue that they go to negative 31 Fahrenheit or negative 15 or negative 13. If you got a vacation house up in Truckee, you might want to get a hair arctic next generation ductless mini split next slide and this is costs so once again i paid a professional contractor to share with me their real pricing and so um this is authentic from the heat pump store in portland oregon and they're working everywhere in between eugene and tacoma washington so big company 50 staff many many heat pumps every day going in and they only do ductless mini splits so this is their this is what it costs. So you get the smallest heat pump that has just one fan coil on a wall and that's $4,500 to install. That's true. That's what it costs me to install my exact system like that. All right. 
So we get a little bit more heating. So instead of 9,000, that nine represents 9,000 BTUs per hour. Once you get 12,000 BTUs per hour, it's only $250 more. So you start thinking like, oh, maybe I should get a bigger heat pump. That's just one spot because it's not that much more expensive. It's all about the labor anyway. All right, that's true for all those blue boxes are all just one spot on the wall and you can get up to 24,000 BTUs, which is called also two tons. Tons refers to literally this. It's a ton of ice, physically a ton of ice sitting in a pool of water that's 32 degrees temperature water. And you're showing it's 12,000 BTUs an hour that it, until it essentially melts over the course of a day, 24 hours, a ton of ice, the capacity of a ton of ice to cool in that. Anyway, so here we go. When you get two zones, the same amount of heating, like at 18,000 BTUs, one zone is $5,600, two zones is 7,000. You know, one zone versus three zones at 2,400, 24,000 BTUs, excuse me, you know, 5,800 versus 8,500. Four zones, five zones. So this is, and they get up to eight zones off of just one box that's sitting outside. And so, and you can get up to sixty thousand BTUs. It's like off the scale of this chart. <laughs> so this can be a really practical way to heat and cool your whole house very comfortably. Every room has its own remote control. Next slide. Um, and do the mini splits go in a window or outside? There is a box that sits outside. That's the air conditioner slash heater. And then there's a skinny little tube of copper that goes like through your walls or underneath your floor or on the wall with a little plastic chase over it so you can't see it and it's painted the same color as your wall or I mean, whatever way you retrofit it in. You, um, this little skinny pot, copper pipe goes to a box that sits on the wall and that box is taking what's in the pipe, the, the hot refrigerant or the cold refrigerant, depending upon the season, and it's blowing a fan over a, like a, lots of little sheets of metal that the, the heat or the cold is essentially radiating from. So there's a fan that blows over that. That's, it's mini because the heat pump that's outside is kind of small compared to what people usually think of them as. And it's a split because there's two boxes. I'll show you package, which means it's just one box. Actually I did, that thing that, that was just a window heat pump that sits on the floor, a little roll around, that's a packaged heat pump. There's not, no split, there's no two things. It's just one thing. Okay, let's say that you lived in Maryland in a fancy old stone house from like 100 or 200 or 300 years ago. The, the Historical Society of Maryland asked me to look at a whole bunch of, of their homes <laughs> and then give them a workshop. So this is one of the examples of, of someone's fancy old house. You can see on the lower left hand, the up close picture. Uh, next slide. So inside the house, um, it is, kind of trash. When you're looking at the, the heating and cooling systems, on the left you can see a window air conditioner, and then you can see below that these really big old-fashioned radiators. They've got a fan in there, um, and they're taking hot water only, no air conditioning happening with them, um, and they're blowing warmth into the room with those big boxes, and they're boiling, boiling, they're, they're heating water to like 160 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit to put through these. Next slide. And what you could do is put a heat pump outside, heat that water with the heat pump, and then you have to replace the radiators inside. So this is the same type of radiator. I found it, it's cool, whatever. And you can see that it can run at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. If you look in the gray, the fourth column over, it says 140 degrees. That's what a heat pump can easily do. Create 140 degree Fahrenheit water. And then, have you run that water through the radiator. And what's going on here is it's telling you how many BTUs per hour this one radiator can produce, so like 4,000 or 6,000, whatever, BTUs per hour. Um, and this is affordable, it's $700 per radiator. You'd put these radiators in so you could pair your system with a heat pump that produced less hot water than what a, a gas boiler would produce. You can get heat pumps to produce water at that temperature, but it's expensive and inefficient. Might as well, this is one strategy. Next slide. And here's another strategy for your, you have an existing radiator system that you're delivering hot water to. And these are different types of radiators. These can work at temperatures of 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is any heat pump, <laughs> a swimming pool heat pump 
um, produces 80 degree Fahrenheit water. And you circulate this very lukewarm water through your house through these specially designed radiators. So there's all different types here, um, just examples all from this company, Yaga, uh, Yaga Climate Designers. Um, so these lovely radiators for your house, this is, this is what you could do. You could switch out your radiators for any of these here and work with it. Catherine Carpenter wants to know, what happens when it drops below freezing? Um, if you are doing, a depends upon your system, but if you were um, heating water outside with a heat pump and delivering water inside the house and there's like water exposed, in Japan, what they do is they wrap the pipe in electrical tape with insulation. Other people in the United States don't like that solution and instead would have a heat pump outside that delivers really hot refrigerant inside to a tank. And then the refrigerant, that's totally impervious to freezing temperatures outside, unlike water. So you'd use refrigerant to deliver the heat to a tank of water and then that tank of water be used to circulate around the building for space heating or be used for domestic hot water or both. So if it depends on your, your confidence in electric, in like electric heat tape and insulation um, if you wanna let your, your hot water pipe be exposed. Um, and oh, lots of good questions here. Um, but let's do next slide. Well, I'm definitely gonna get to all the questions as best I can. So here are examples of heat pumps that deliver water inside. Snow country, I mentioned before, this is something that people do all over. Is so they'll, they'll take an outside heat pump like a space pack um, that's on the left or Chiltrex. These are kind of the two leading brands in California. There's lots of others. Um, and you, uh, you heat the water, you cool the water, it goes in through a pipe into the house. It then goes into tanks and gets distributed around. So next slide. Here are uh, more systems. So on the top, these are ground source heat pumps. Um, they're popular in Canada still, popular in like the Midwest and upper Northern states where people are less confident in their air source heat pumps. These are using the, the ground's heat. Um, but laying all those pipes underneath the ground is expensive frequently, unless you're in a state that has a lot of drilling because they've been fracking everywhere. And so everyone's got a drill rig. <laughs> and your ground is fluffy and dirt, not like rock. And then ground source heat pumps actually make financial sense. But on the bottom there, these are air source heat pumps that sit outside um, and produce hot water that goes inside. And then here's the radiant floors on the left-hand side. These are systems. Both of these are, are examples of if you had a radiant floor system, these are all heat pumps that could handle that. Um, that relatively low temperature, 80 degrees Fahrenheit to 120 Fahrenheit. Let's see, and Scott Horner was just asking a quick one, how many square feet per zone? Really depends upon your climate and your insulation, but a zone can be as much as 1500 square feet or it can be as small as a bedroom, you know, like a 150 square feet or 200 square feet. And the heat pumps are usually, a good heat pump can ramp itself down to just a trickle, a tiny little trickle of heat and cool. So you can have each of the zones be very much what you want. Well, the problem with a radiant floor is that the floor has a lot of thermal lag, so it doesn't heat or cool quickly. And the zones are frequently quite big. Um, so while people like having a warm floor, we all like having warm toes. Um, there are downsides to using the radiant floor and upsides to well insulating a floor and then using an air source heat pump and maybe having like some rugs <laughs> around the house. Next slide. People might say, oh, I've got one of those cool old Eichler houses and I want to put a heat pump in, but I don't know anyone who will do it. Okay, here's all of the people we called them. These are people who do hydronic heat pumps. If that's your game, they're here for you. And, uh, and there's more, but these are all people experienced with air source heat pumps being hooked up to Bay Area hydronic housing needs. So you are not alone, you're totally supported. You can get three bids, all that. Next slide. Um, okay, I wanted to like give you a cautionary tale. I'm still talking about comfort, still talking about the various types of heat pumps that heat and cool houses. There is one type that I, I want people to, like, it's just, they're so expensive 
and they're and they're they're kind of have some issues. It's called variable refrigerant flow. VRFs are frequently used in commercial buildings where they'll put a really big heat pump up on a roof, and then they'll run a trunk line, like a pipe, big pipe of refrigerant, relatively big, to a box, which is called a manifold. And that box then holds the refrigerant, hot or cold, and then distributes it through lots of little pipes. And every juncture along the way is a place where refrigerant can leak and will leak. And each of those junctures where you have, you stop the refrigerant and you have to repump it is a place where you have to have a pump and you have to have an alarm. And you start having to also listen to pumps gurgling and making noises all over the building. All of this is fine when it's a commercial office building. It's not so fine when it's gurgling in your bedroom. And it's not so cool that it's the most expensive possible way. And in, in many ways, it's also the most likely to leak refrigerant, which is a terrible global warming, warming agent. Most of the refrigerants we're using in the United States are bad, bad stuff. Not nearly as bad as the leaks that are coming from your gas system right now. Just to be clear, heat pump leakage is nowhere near, like a, a tiny 5% fraction of what we're talking about with your natural gas leakage system. Itty bitty, not worth talking about. Electrify immediately, do it however you need to do it. That said, <laughs> if you can avoid systems that leak refrigerant, that's much better. So this is the most expensive way. I see it being recommended by people. I'm just trying to steer you away from the biggest heat pumps that have the most infrastructure and cost the most money called VRF or variable refrigerant flow. And all the systems we've just been going through can do the same job. Um, next slide. Now we're gonna talk about kitchens. <clears throat> so we're done with the warming your house. I just went through a bunch of different technologies there, air source pumps, air to water heat pumps, ground source heat pumps. Um, and I'll answer all sorts of questions in the Q&A, just so you know, um, try to get to your specific house's needs. Now we're gonna talk about kitchens. So on the left-hand side, um, there's an induction walk that's in David Canada's kitchen in Cupertino. A uh, really cute video of watching him using it. It's a, his was from 11 years ago, he put it in. I think, I think it was in 2011. So I guess it's 11 years ago, actually. Um, then on the right-hand side, Erica Reinhardt, uh, she also has an air to water heat pump for their radiant floors. But this is so cute. Um, stoves are, absolutely terrible gas stoves are a horror story so horror story like i'm my wife and i are pregnant um she comes home from the farm every day where she's ranching in the rain up here and she opens up the oven and turns on the gas oven and she just warm herself and we didn't realize that the nitrogen dioxide that comes off of stoves causes premature births which sucks because we had our babies twins two months early and it really was rough on all of us <laughs> you know everyone's fine but understanding that I might have been causing the premature birth or, you know, our total ignorance of how dangerous the fumes off of just, it's like burning gasoline in your house. You know, you, no one goes out and cooks food next to the exhaust of their car, but there's so much exhaust. It's just that it's the particular fossil fuel that's burning. You can't smell it and you can't see it really but it's super bad <laughs> and so bad that it's way worse than outside air on smog days. Think about that. Like the inside kitchen air is more dangerous for asthmatics in your house than the outside air on bad smog days. So if you have an asthmatic in your household, if you have anyone who has a cardiopulmonary illness, who's on, you know, taking pills because they got to do blood thinners, so they don't have a heart attack, et cetera, all of that, get rid of your gas stove immediately. If they're the person who's cooking on that gas stove, go get them one of those $100 or $200 two burner induction ranges, which is what I did. Once I realized how incredibly foolish and dangerous we're being and how much I love my children and I want them to learn how to cook because I'm a cook, it comes back like this is, this is safe. Like an induction range, it doesn't get hot so your kid doesn't get burned touching the stove. It doesn't release any dangerous fumes. When you take the pan off, it turns off automatically. <laughs> and, and it's like, it is so safe that you can let little kids use them. They're just like, there's hardly any scenarios in which they get hurt other than, you know, boiling water, never have boiling water, but like pancakes, this little three-year-old is making pancakes under supervision and it's not dangerous. <sighs> and you can cook anything you want. Every single possible ethnic dish out there it has a specialized electric version of the cooking device without exception, just so you know. 
There's, there's any food you want to make, you can make it with electricity. Okay, next slide. And if you like um, Taylor Swift, you can note that she dances around her house making her new music videos so she can own her own songs, thank you, um, with her induction range right there. And there you can see a whole bunch of them. Uh, and Pava is made in um, an industrial city just now sort of south of San Francisco. There's GE and Frigidaire and Samsung is fun because they have little blue lights that kind of look like flames. They're trying to help you transition. Um, and there's lots of these, of ranges that in higher quality and lower quality and pricey and et cetera. Um, so you can just see on the upper left-hand corner, those box and whisker graphs, the X shows you, um, I think it's the, not exactly the average, it's the median. There's a difference between the averages and medians, but anyway, uh, roughly the line in the middle and the X kind of a up with the average. But you can see the top and the bottom, for like 24 inch up to, from say like $400 up to $1,500 and the different sizes for these in, in counter ranges. Next slide. Now, if you are a landlord, you're probably looking at the ones up here on the top. These are less than $550. Yeah, a Madeline, good point. You can rent the portable ones, try them out, or give them to your friends as Christmas gifts because they're only like 120 bucks for that. And for drink, bod, drink Pod's True Induction, which I'm telling you is the best one. <laughs> um, so anyway, up on top here, these are less than $550, but they're glass tops. So your tenants um, don't have to scrape away. Neither do you when you, you flip the unit. You have to scrape away like with gas or with the electric coils, they all get like burnt stuff in them. Glass tops, the way to go. Then on the bottom, if you're running a bed and breakfast and you're trying to like keep up appearances, um, you can see some really fancy bed and breakfast friendly versions. The AGA on the far right, Interesting story about AGA. It was invented by a chemist who had a bunch of fuels blow up in his face and blinded him. And so he invented an electric range like around 1920, the AGA brand, it was based upon him trying to keep his wife from ever having to suffer what he had just gone through, having like a, an explosion in his face. So AGA is still making some really nice induction and electric resistant ranges with all those fancy ovens. Next slide. And this is kind of the normal stuff. This is the thousand to $2,500 ones on the top, those slide in induction ranges. And uh, then a slightly fancier down below, the 3,000 to $7,500 ones. You know, the ones are like 48 inches wide. Those you're gonna spend more, but you know that with gas or electric, either way, once you get up to like the 40 to 50 inch ranges, those are $4,000. If you don't wanna spend that much money, get a 30 inch range and then put in a cutting board next to it. <laughs> um, next slide. Laundry retrofits. Once again, pointing out that this is um, the least expensive, high quality way to get your laundry done and allow yourself to get an EV car. I'll show you this in a second, but basically like, if you go to just like a plug-in outlet in your wall to get your laundry done, that frees up 30 amps of capacity at 240 volt, which is very fast charging for a car. So you get like a great washer dryer situation, no more arguments over forwarding your laundry, and you get an EV charger space for fast charging out of this. So you can hear you can see some prices, you know, it's as cheap as $800, as much as, you know, almost two grand for different types of high efficiency washers and dryers. Next slide. Okay, so the one on the right-hand side is the one that I'm like, this is the one uh, because it's 4.5 cubic feet and it's the biggest of the ones that are out there. And LG is also considered like, right now they have a really good reputation as appliances. People like LG, just they keep on getting highly scored in the various best of ratings. Um, and to be clear, I don't have any business relationship with anybody at all. So I'm just giving you my own personal opinions. <laughs> I work for affordable housing developers and none of them pay me to talk about what I think about appliances. <laughs> so, um, except to give them my honest advice, which I'm doing with you as well. Okay, so yeah, the one on the right, the biggest one, the LG one, I like that the most, but there are less expensive ones for smaller homes and apartments and accessory dwelling units and things like that. And this is the way that laundry is done in most of the world. The way we do it in the United States with separate machines that take up a bunch of space is crazy. 
most of the rest of the world uses combined condensing washer dryers. So much so that when you go to Europe, that's, that is the thing. People don't do it like we do it. <laughs> we take up lots more space, lots more money. It's a real hassle. You got to do special wiring. Everywhere else, they're like, just get one of these and plug it in anywhere. Next slide. Okay, this is supposed to illustrate the difference between the power needs. Okay, so on the left-hand side is an electric resistance dryer or a heat pump dryer that has electric resistance backup. Both of those are essentially electric resistance dryers that use a lot of juice. So 7,200 watts versus say 1,800 watts, which is what you would see with a heat pump dryer versus the condensing that I'm encouraging you towards um, at 1,400 watts. And this is what um, fast charging looks like with a car, 7,200 watts. So you can go from 7,200 watts with an electric resistance dryer, as I did, down to 1,400 watts, and then make all the space you need for a, a big, fast car charger. Next slide. OK, I'm going to expand on this. That was my transition. I wanted to expand on, consider avoiding a panel upgrade. Think about this carefully. So on the left-hand side is a 50 amp um, panel. This is what you might actually need, although it'd be very rare for anyone to actually put you in a 50 amp panel. But I'll show you in a moment, that's actually kind of what the amount of power people use in their nice big homes. <laughs> now, 100 amp panels, this is um, what we've been required to have in homes since 1962 to this day. We're required by the National Electrical Code to have 100 amp panels. California is the only state in the United States that has required 200 amp panels starting with the 2016 code. And that was done to make capacity for electric vehicles. Didn't have to, like I just showed you, could have just like stuck with a condensing washer dryer, but this is what happened. <laughs> and also the 200 amp panel allows for you to put more solar on. Um, you can essentially only put, well, there's a, some complicated math in this, but Frequently, if you have a 100 amp panel, you can only do 16% of that panel in solar going out. Functionally, that means about a four kilowatt array can fit on a 100 amp panel. And a lot of people want a five, the average is a five kilowatt array in California. So a lot of people get triggered to go up to a 200 amp panel. There are technical tricks to avoid that. There's, that's more detail than we're gonna go into right now. But essentially you put the solar array, you put in a larger bus bar, <laughs> and then you put the solar array on the bus bar and Anyway, but it's expensive. This is supposed to tell you like going from a 100 amp panel to a 200 amp panel, this requires a new wire to come to your house. If it's an underground wire right now, oh boy, that's 16 to $20,000 to run a new underground wire. If you're lucky and it's overhead, it's only 2,000 to 7,000. It's a lot of money to run a new wire. So I'm gonna try to teach you how to be on a watt diet. This 400 amp panel, this is an example of my friend who's a, a rabbi. He was put up, you know, uh, rabbinates frequently, like they'll they have you a house for you and you get to be in this big fancy house. The rabbi gets a house. So I'm visiting him in his house, this family, and it's uh, in this lovely spot out in the hills, a retreat center. And I go down and look at his panel because I'm, I'm that kind of friend. And it's a 400 amp panel, which I'd never seen before in the real world. <laughs> and explain like, oh, you have an electric resistance water heater oh, you have an electric resistance hot tub out on the back porch. Oh my, you know, I was looking around realizing just everything had been done with the highest power demand possible device. And this 400 amp panel is at the end of a long driveway out in the woods. I mean, it required a lot of infrastructure to deliver to it. It was many, many, many thousands of dollars upstream of private power line to get to this house. I, it was startling to me how expensive I realized all of that was. So let's avoid that if you can. Next slide. And Sean, I will chime in that we do have roughly about 30 minutes for the presentation and Q&A remaining. Okay, oh, we're good then. <clears throat> I'm not gonna be too much longer and I really okay. want to do Q&A. Yes, okay, uh, next slide. Okay, assuming a typical older single family home in California with a 100 amp panel service. Is it possible for a homeowner to go all electric, including space and water heating, cooking, clothes drying, EV charging without an expensive service upgrade? Next slide. Yes. Here's a 3,000 square foot home and its circuit breaker panel on the left. 
In blue are all the things that the code requires. You can ignore that. In green are the things that we, we work with on power efficiency. So the first one on the right-hand side, you can see it says resistance dryer and heat pump water heater. And we're using a little plug strip there to connect it to a 240 volt plug strip. I'm grabbing it right now, my prop. Okay, so this is what SMUD is doing in their territory is they're putting in these, these plug strips so they can electrify homes without doing service upgrades. So this is real world. Another California utility is way into it. Down below, you see the same thing. The range is being combined with the EV charger on this little plug strip. I'm holding it in my hand for those of you on video. This box is a 240 volt plug strip. You plug a dryer on this side and an EV charger on this side, that kind of thing. And allows both devices on one plug. Saves tons of money and time. On the left-hand side of this, you can see we used a ductless heat pump. I'm emphasizing the word ductless because duct work requires a bigger, more powerful fan to blow air, and it loses a lot of heat in the duct work. So if you go ductless, this would have been a 30 amp, but you see this says a number 20 instead. So we saved 10 amps of power, 240 volts, so 2,400 watts by um, going ductless. And here you can see it says number 16. That's the 16 amps that's allowed for this house's panel. Uh, which has a 100 amp service and a 100 amp bus bar in this case. So that's kind of small. Um, that, what that equates to, like I said, is about a four kilowatt system. But uh, the EV charger that can you know, charge 38 miles per hour, you know, really fast charging. Okay, next slide. Here's a cute example. Lisa and Steve Schmidt of Home Energy Analytics. They're using this uh, plug strip strategy in the real world they got. The, the combined washer dryer, so they just got rid of that power demand. They got a heat pump water heater, they're combining it with the, their stove, and they also are balancing their two Teslas with one of these 240 volt plug strips, so both the car chargers are, are plugged into it. Next slide. Now, on the left-hand side, this is if you follow the National Electrical Code in a ground-up code-based way. All of this is how and it's the question is, um, is there room left for a heat pump water heater? Okay, so no, right here, you have a whole bunch of, get, of electric devices and you filled up your whole 100 amp panel. On the right hand side, this is if you actually study your house's demand. This is another legitimate way, load calc per 220.87. In the real world, this house is only using about 30 amps at peak and studied an entire year. You look at a whole year's worth of, of hourly or 15 minute data grabs, I think it's hourly. And the, then you add 25% to that. And then the rest of the things you can add is you can prove out your house did not use that much of your power. So two different strategies. On the left-hand side, you can get stuck. On the right-hand side, if you study your house legitimately, then, oh yeah, you can add more. Next slide. These are real homes, a dozen of them in the Bay Area. In blue is the actual capacity being used. So you're seeing like 35 amps. If you see like this is about 35%, you can convert that in your head, 100 amp panel, 35 amps. In green is the stuff not being used. Okay, and these nearly all electric homes on the right-hand side, they're not any different. They're just not using much more power, if at all. So this, the strategy of having your electrician look at a year's worth of your bills and figure out what your peak was, the, the peakiest peak of peaks, adding 25% to that and then saying, okay, all the rest of this is your actual capacity. This allows you to put a lot more stuff of that's all electric into your home completely legitimately and safely. Next slide. These are all different strategies. There's space heating and these numbers, 1200, 4,000, 500, 500. These are all different wattages of strategies. I don't want to belabor this because that's what the book is for. And we go through all these different options, but you can see you have options for water heating, options for cooking, for laundry, for electric vehicle charging. And then in green on the bottom, those are the, the plug strips showing negative, like you can actually gain capacity um, on your panel that way. So lots of different choices is my point. because so I'm trying to encourage you not to spend three to nine months trying to increase the service to your house and instead just Use what you got. It almost certainly is enough. Next slide. Hey, what's the least expensive strategy to go big on a small panel? I'm saying it, use the plug strips. Next slide. 
Um, here's load managing main panels. We're also seeing those go in where um, it's not like a plug store, but basically there's a computer in there that's, that's uh, shifting load around so that you can stay on a 100 amp panel. But if you're getting too close to the 100 amps, just hypothetically, somehow, because it really doesn't happen. But if that was happening, this computer inside the panel would start shutting things off that you had chosen, like shut off the refrigerator for an hour or you know, whatever, shut off the water heater probably, or shut off the car charger uh, in order to make sure that we don't go past the capacity of the panel. So they're, they're called smart panels. Next slide. And same thing, uh, smart sub panels. Next slide. Mist-based fireplaces. I love this, my house. I made my little house so Christmassy this year. I had it right on the table next to my cute little rosemary Christmas tree. And you can stick your hands in it and it doesn't light your hand on fire. <laughs> it's just, it looks like flame, but it's, uh, it's mist lit with LEDs or halogens, depending upon the brand. And like you can have a pride parade where the fire in the bar is all rainbowed. You can do it for St. Patrick's Day in the bar. It's all green, you know, the who just won this football team won, or you can get their colors in the fireplace sports bars, hotels, or just in your own house. Looks just like flame, way more convincing than almost anything else. Next slide. Here's examples of the different brands out there. Um, they're also less expensive, less expensive than a gas fireplace, less expensive than a wood fireplace, less expensive to purchase, less expensive to install, less expensive. Next slide. Here's your saunas, if you want electric saunas, lots of electric saunas. They're just like a 240 volt electric space heater, basically. A really powerful, fast space heater. Next slide. If you're outside and you don't want to have a carbon monoxide headache, you're tired of poisoning your guests by making them stay warm next to the carbon monoxide, um, here's like heated tables so your knees are warm, or you can have like fire sense in the middle, heat at the top of your head <laughs> or aura. You can have heaters all over the place that are electric, 120 volt plug in kind of thing. Um, next slide. Barbecues, way safer, way easier. Um, the only things allowed on boats, of course, no open flames on boats. Every boat you've ever been on was an all electric boat. Next slide. And this is fun. It's the law now in California. We've got to get rid of all these gas devices. So you're going to get to have a much better life because they're so much quieter. I mean, I grew up chainsawing wood because I grew up in rural Wisconsin. We had you know, wood furnaces, plural, and making fuel mix getting it all over your hands, having to drive into the gas station in town because you ran out, but the gas station's a 15 mile drive each way. And it's like, God, man. So this is awesome. The plug-in version, I have a whole bunch of them here and they're terrific toys, much more fun, lighter weight, easy to use, et cetera. Next slide. Okay, CJ is out here in the dunes. He has one of the only swimming pools in our community. And I love the man for letting me teach my kids how to swim in his pool. He uses a heat pump now. You see all those solar thermal panels? He's got like $30,000 of solar thermal panels there. He gets rid of all of them and the gas water heater that it was paired with. And he puts in a heat pump water heater, which makes heat in the wintertime, <laughs> unlike the solar thermal panels. And so he's got a heat pump that's electric that's being run off of PV panels in the house. And inside there's pineapples, there's sugar cane, there's a rope swing. I mean, it's epic. Tomatoes and peppers and flowers and all of it. Um, with this cute like old 1950s swimming pool. So um, heat pumps, nothing like an 85 degree temperature swimming pool on a cold January day. Next slide. Here they are. Aquacal is kind of a brand leader. They go the coldest. They are acknowledged to be just sort of like the, also the biggest. If you want to do Olympic pools, Aquacal is the biggest. But Hayward and Pentair are well supported in the Bay Area as are all three of these brands. Next slide. Who in the Bay Area is experienced with heat pump pools? There's four of them. We called, we made sure. Pacific, Canterell, Hills Pool Service, Excel, they're all good folks. They do, they do them, they're happy to do pool heat pumps. Next slide. All right, <clears throat> you don't have the money for a Tesla Powerwall? Well, all of these can plug solar panels in, just plug in. And there's the ones that are cheap on the left, like the Pecron. For 170 bucks, you can plug a solar panel into this. We have rock piles and rivers and the goal zero. So you can get different batteries and you don't have to hire an electrician. You just buy it. You can, you can get plug-in solar panels real easy and you got your resiliency strategy there. Next slide. 
This is the next wave though. Just use your car. It's been going on since 1994. After the Fukushima earthquake, you know, slash all the nuclear power plants got shut down in Japan, Nissan started letting them people use their cars for backup in 2011. It's finally coming to the United States and the F-150 Lightning extended pack, extra 10 grand. This is a huge battery. This is equal to about 15 Tesla Powerwalls on wheels. And you'll be able to plug this into your house and run your house for weeks without even a solar array. <laughs> such a big battery. So this is the cheap way to go. And then these ones on the bottom, like Wallbox, Asiaco, these work with Nissans and Hyundais and things like that. Next slide. There, Whew. did it. All righty -o. So I'm gonna go to questions. Um, Anonymous wants to know how best to electrify radiant floor water-based heating of Eichlers. And will heat pumps be sufficient? Yes. And you'd use a heat pump and I'd probably recommend space pack because that's the bigger of the two. And your Eichler is so poorly insulated, you probably need like a four ton heat pump. <laughs> if it was insulated, you need a two ton heat pump. Arthur asks, I've heard that a heat pump water heater can be moderately noisy. Yes, it can be 50 to 55 decibels, which is like an old fashioned loud refrigerator. And it has different harmonics too. You, you solve that by putting it outside in a closet, put it in the garage. If you're gonna put it where your water heater is inside the house, totally fine. But put acoustic insulation in the closet, spend an extra hundred bucks on some insulation bats and labor, and that will make it quiet. You know, put it on like a, a, a vibration isolation pad, spend 20 bucks at the hardware store on that. Just a little bit of acoustic work on it, totally makes it doable. Um, and uh, Betsy Megas asks, I expect a need to replace my roof and siding for other reasons. What other things should I look at doing for electrification and efficiency while well, things are already opened up? I have pretty good insulation already. Um, well, if you put a called exterior foam insulation, it could be cork if you wanna go natural, um, like sheet cork, inch or two inch thick cork, it's just as good as foam. It's the original foam insulation, or you can get foam. And you put that down to cover the studs and the rafters. And that does a remarkably good job of preventing heat running in and out of a building because the studs are called heat highways. So if you, if you have everything exposed, consider putting down just an extra inch of um, sheet insulation, cork or, uh, or foam, or even, I think you can even do mineral wool. Um, Kathleen Flynn, if one already has ducts in the home, from a forced air gas heating system, then you switch to the electric heat pump. Is it better to go with something that uses the ducts or go ductless? Well, if you're okay with your system now, then keep it so much cheaper. Put a heat pump where the furnace is. Super simple, done all the time. Super duper 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 simple. Just take out the gas box and put a, the same size box that's a heat pump box. And then you get air conditioning out of the same duct system as you have your heating system. Uh, just the good thing to do is like seal the ducts, spend a few hundred dollars up there with tape, like the real tape, not duct tape, but that's not for duct work, but real mastic tape, whatever, um, and, and make sure the, the, the various vents are well sealed. It usually leaks around the vents. Um, and that's a cheap way to get a lot more heating out of a system. Susan Lesson asks, what about, uh, what about if I'm living in an apartment or a condo? How much electrification can be done? most of it except the water heater. So you can put countertop induction ranges on. I love them, that's what I use for myself. I never went and got a big expensive one. I like the countertop ones, it gives me more space. It's more flexible. I have two cooking stations, one over there, one over here. So my kids or my spouse could cook over there and I can be over here, I love it. Um, you can do portable heat pumps like I showed, that $600 one. Um, that you can put in a window, heat your whole apartment that way, toasty warm, or get two of them, you know? two zones. Uh, you can get the condensing washer dryer and plug that in um, into a kitchen outlet and drain it into the kitchen sink. So you can electrify the dryer if that's a, a thing you need to do. And it's just the water heater, you gotta have a plumber in there. So then you need help with that one. Um, with John Ennell says, with electricity in the Bay Area being 30 cents a kilowatt hour, I think it will be way more expensive to heat my house with a heat pump than with gas. Why is solar not being used for water heating? Okay, so John, you're right. 
in the Bay Area, study, I studied that area specifically, you're definitely going to spend like an extra $100 or something for the winter heating season unless you put in solar panels. Solar electric panels should be with your electrification because California is a whole different conversation. Our CPUC has, I mean, this is to be frank, it's been corrupted. The, the president in 2015 had his house raided and they found out that PG had been sending women to his house with wine for hot tub visits had spent more than $100,000 on a party for him. You know, SoCal Edison in 2014, they met with the President Pickert in Warsaw, Poland to negotiate a $2.5 billion discount that the, the ratepayers had to pay for to shut down the San Onofre nuclear power plant. And that is all in the San Francisco Chronicle and the Sacramento Bee. And it was, it was more than 170 examples of corruption they documented between 2009 and 2015 with staff support, that's in the paper, right? And most of our current rate structures were set up then. So we have a problem in California with the highest electricity prices in the country and in the Bay Area, it's even worse. So the only way out of this mess is to put in renewable energy up on the roof. And the other way, we figured this out, is use that big vehicle. Get a Ford F-150 Lightning and sell your electricity in the evening, and you can, you can eliminate your utility bill with that expensive electricity sold at just the right time. Can't really control solar panels that way. You can with your big old vehicle battery. So that's how you win. But this might be one of those things where it costs you a little bit more money to do the right thing. Um, Anonymous wants to know, what's the lifetime of a ductless mini split uh, system? Somewhere between 10 and 30 years, depending upon your maintenance and if you got lucky with a good product or a not so good product. They usually say 15 to 20 years, but you know. Um, you are wondering how long a new system will last. Um, I'd say 15 years this is a reasonable thing. I had one mini split for 10 years and it was just fine. I just wanted a new one because the, the new ones were so much better. Um, so I know that they last 10 years, no problem. And I mean, there's lots of studies on that, but I can just say that that happened. Um, what Bill Hilton wants to know, uh, who's using climate friendly refrigerants? All of Eurasia, UL is a private company and they stepped in and they said that propane, which is a very low global warming potential refrigerant used all over Europe was just too flammable, even though the refrigerants in heat pumps are flammable. <laughs> Even though natural gas is flammable and it's piped all through our house, they said, oh, you know, 16 ounces of propane is the most you can have in the United States. So that's one problem is that like everyone else is using good stuff. It's just the United States. Now, within the United States, um, Amana is getting packaged heat pumps using R32, which is a low global warming potential refrigerant. So you can get it like a, a hotel type heat pump with a good refrigerant. Not that great of an offer. Um, Sanco 2, it's the San, CO2 heat pump, Sanco 2. That's a water heater. It's too big for most people. It's like size for Japanese sitting tubs and most Americans don't take a sitting tub. So it's, it's like literally four, four times as much BTUs per hour as an American heat pumps. But that's using CO2 if that's a top priority. But I'll just say really clearly, it's like 20 times worse that you're using gas than if you evacuated all the refrigerant Get off the gas fast as you can. Worry about the refrigerants later. It's really on a global scale. It's not nearly as big of a problem as natural gas. Not even close. Um, Sean, I did want to chime in with one question that yes. we did have here, uh, which is, does blown in insulation get compacted down after many years? And does this affect the energy efficiency of blown in insulation? It, the old style stuff does. So the old days, they didn't put sticky, starchy stuff in it. And, the, and depending upon the blown product you get now, when the walls are open, you can blow it and it will stay there forever. When you're doing the blown in drill and fill, it's not so sticky and you shouldn't expect for it to fill. And neither will you expect that out of foam. Really, you can't expect any product that you do drill and fill to do a great job of filling the entire cavity. Like I, there's just tons of infrared studies that have shown it just doesn't, that's not reality. If you can't see it, you can't really do a perfect job. And there's wires and things in there that stop the stuff from falling down. And you can do it on a grid, which we did with foam, but the foam doesn't expand perfectly. Like you just, there's no way around it. There's no perfect way. If you do sheet cork on the inside of your walls and then put drywall on top of that, 
that never sinks, but you do lose an inch of your wall, you know, the interior. There's, so there's, you should do it. Do the drill and fill. It's better than not. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Thank you. We probably have time for about one or two more questions. Okay. And if Jeffrey has any answers to these questions okay, as well. Okay, well, Steinfeld, is, what's the best induction again? I said drink pod. Yeah, for cheap ones, 120, uh, 120 bucks. That's the drink pod one. A uh, slide in versus built in. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by uh, if you do a slide, if you do a, a built in, it often takes more power. A separate oven from a separate range uses twice as much power on the, the panel. So a built all together is good for power conservation. Um, any alternatives to the gas barbecues? Tons of them. I showed that as one of the last slides. Wall mounted ovens recommendations? I don't have any recommendations. Lots of them are fine. Um, how much more efficient is a heat pump dryer versus a comparable electric dryer? It uses one half to one third as much energy if they're both equally good, but a really good electric resistance dryer is just as good as a bad heat pump dryer. <laughs> so you go for the best ones of either. Um, the Summit washer dryer combo is just small, but it's fine. Um, how long is the complete cycle? Somewhere between like three to four hours if you're drying and washing for the condensing washer dryer. Any experience with the span IO service panel? Uh, I don't have any real experience with it, no. Um, a SMUD though is. Um, any heat pumps with refrigerants of global point potential one or lower on the residential side, only the Sanco two. Um, do you need a larger heat pump water heater than your gas water heater? No, you can have the same size, but store the water at 140 Fahrenheit with a mixing valve. It's a standard strategy and then mix it out to 120 Fahrenheit, like normal delivery. And you can have what feels like essentially the exact same service as even a large gas water heater. But fundamentally, yes, gas might have 40,000 BTUs while a heat pump would have 4,000. So it doesn't have the ability to do makeup nearly as fast. So you store it either in a larger volume or at a hotter temperature or both. Um, and the Miele is a really high quality brand. Tessa, you're planning on buying a Miele and it uses 20, 30 amps required. Yeah, and I, I mean, it might be better. It, you, might lose, you might use less energy over the course of a year with the heat pump dryer. You use a lot less energy in the moment with the condensing washer dryer. So if you're trying to electrify your house, all of your loads, I strongly suggest the condensing washer dryer because it limits all of the chain reactions of not having enough power for your EV or for your, your stove and such. Um, and is a power, Arthur Black, is a power constrained 100 amp panel with gas jets for temps below freezing a reasonable compromise? No, just don't use any gas at all because even the connection to your house, just the 1% leakage there is equal to all the CO2 that from another 99% burning. So 1% leakage, just because you're just your meter leaks 1%. There's a pressure release valve that is a leak valve that leaks 1% that equals all of the global warming potential of the combustion of the other 99%. It's that bad. So you got to get rid of gas, the connection to your house. The meter itself is one of the big problems. So I think we have time just for about one more question and then I will pass it over to our sustainability commissioner, Justin Wang to wrap up this evening. Um, I will also say before John chooses, I, I know, you know there's lots of questions. Um, again, our energy advisors can help with a lot of these questions when Sean is no longer available. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, oh man. Um, Okay, why not just make hot water directly to solar here in sunny, snowy Sunnyvale instead of PV? Okay, solar hot water does not work in the winter. It is not a winter heating system. You can get it to maybe lukewarm on a sunny day, but on like Christmas or such, there's one fifth as much energy on the winter solstice as the summer solstice. And so heat pump, a heat pump works in the winter time. If you put solar thermal on a heat pump, a heat pump is a solar thermal collector. It collects the ambient energy, the heat energy of the air created by the sun. And it works at night. It also works when it's really cold outside because it just chills the refrigerant. A solar thermal collector is a heat pump. It's just not using phase change. So it's not boiling. And in the boiling process, you store tons of energy. Solar thermal uses propylene glycol, which never boils. 
So it can't store as much heat in the liquid and it's not chilled liquid. So in the winter time, it's not able to absorb heat nor is it able to release it at a high temperature. Like solar thermal just doesn't work for almost a third of the year in any significant way. It's really expensive and it can't, so you, like the, the cheap, efficient, effective way, because it works in the winter is to do PV and a heat pump. Solar thermal is great, but unless you're on the equator, it doesn't give you the same amount of energy every day. And that ends up becoming a big problem of making oversized expensive systems to support wintertime use. When in fact, in the summertime, it's just making way too much heat and wasting a whole bunch of it and potentially actually breaking the system because of heat buildup can, can bust the seams. And you see solar thermal collectors breaking frequently over the years, seen lots of it, water just sheeting off the roof because they get so hot and they're up in the sun. So it, they're just not even that durable of a, you can call a solar thermal collector a heat pump. It really, in so many ways, it's the same thing. Pumps, refrigerant that's in it, collecting energy from the sun. It's just not very efficient. And it's not using the phase change of boiling to, to do a lot of energy movement work. Okay, so with that, <laughs> that's well, the, the do PV and heat pumps. Thank you so much, Sean. That was uh, an intense lightning round of, of questions. I know there's more in the chat, but unfortunately, we do have to wrap up for tonight. So just one last reminder for everyone to fill out the evaluation. The link is in the chat and will be emailed to the attendees. And if you, you know, in a few days, if you can't remember, you know, you thought of a cool thing that Sean said, but can't remember it, the recording will be emailed in a few days following the event. So again, huge thank you to, to Sean, to Jeffrey, to the city staff and to the audience for, you know, spending your Wednesday, Wednesday evening here in this webinar. And finally, please continue joining us for our upcoming electric vehicle workshop. Uh, it's called New Year's Revolution, Drive Electric in 2022 on February 23rd from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And you can register in a link that I believe was just shared in the chat. So again, thank you so much to uh, the audience and to our guests and to the staff that worked to make this happen. Please have a lovely rest of your evening. All right. Good night, everybody. Um, just so you know, propane is a lot better than natural gas because there's a global warming potential of four instead of 82. <laughs> so people are asking, like, is propane as bad as natural gas? No, propane, even when leaked, is not a terrible thing. Natural gas, when leaked, is a total environmental disaster. So if you have to choose between a combustion fuel, definitely go get propane because um, it has one half or less the global warming potential. Um, because its leaks are not a disaster. It's just, it's a different chemical. Okay, with that, <laughs> good night, y'all. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>